Uh, Folsom, I need you to know. Sorry, it's kind of loud. I need you to know roughly where they are, where they span, how to grip them, but I don't need the specific attachments because they're heinous. They're just all in the place. So if you know the general region of some of these back muscles, that's the key point. The suboccipital muscles, the portal muscles in the back of the neck have very, very specific attachments, and it's a region of interest. So it's the first region of interest we're going to be covering. I guess the second, if you think of the temperament and who's going to be the first. And you do need to know their nerve supply and their very specific attachments. And then we're going to start the shoulder, the bones of the upper limb. And that's when game goes on quickly. And there's a lot of muscles, a lot of nerves, a lot of function, uh, a lot of attachments. And your next class, we're going to talk about what flows through the axilla or your armpit, which is a nerve plexus that comes from the upper cervical, well, mid cervical, and upper thoracic T1 spinal nerve segment. That supplies everything in your arm. So the brachial plexus is like a freeway of nerves, and you need to know it very, very well. And we'll also cover the blood supply on Wednesday. So uh, we did talk about the abdominal muscles. Remember, there are basically uh, four big ones and one tiny little one for amygdalus, which is still there. 20% of you might not have it. So five per side. I don't again care about the specifics of the attachment, but just generally where they would run. If you came across one on a pitch, you would know what it was and what it does. And the nerve supply is basically going to be, at least on the anterior surface, on the anterior rami and basically the lower thoracic vertebrae. So as they come out, they supply chunks of muscle. So multiple, multiple innervations for these abdominal muscles. Okay? And on the posterior aspect, there'll be a few from the dorsal rings that go to these muscles as well. So rectus abdominis right down the midline, basically a segmented four chunk muscle. And it's bilateral and it's right in the center. So activation of that will bring the sternum to the pelvis or the pelvis up to the sternum, either one. So trunk flexion. If you look to the side, the most superficial um, abdominal muscles, external oblique. And again, I like it, it's fibers as running as if you're putting your hand in your pocket. Okay, so they run this way, and they run always from back towards the midline, but stop and become a member of the sheath, like the other two do. Deep to that, if you get rid of it, it has the internal oblique, and its fibers kind of run in a different direction. It's a better figure in the old more, but on this side, it'll run from my hip up, so perpendicular to the external oblique fibers, and they're deeper. As you get down near the pelvis, they kind of run horizontally, and then they actually do, do run sort of vertically to some extent. They're a lot smaller and thinner down here. You remove that, and transverse abdominals. Basically, it's parallel, so it runs all the way around to the front, from back to front. And both it and the internal oblique, again, end as they get to the rectus abdominals. So the abdominal protection of the abdomen is complete. You got three layers on the, on the back and the sides and out towards the front, and just one muscle right down the midline. And we do have little little pyramidalis down here, but it, it's only a short muscle. So these membranes from external leg, internal leg, and transverse abdominis, they come around and surround the rectus abdominis. Okay? And they sheath it in the rectus sheath. And there's a line right down the middle, a very thick line called the linea alba, which is your belly button of connective tissue. So the dense center part is dense, dense, dense connective tissue. So if you're going to open somebody up, that's when you would go down that linea alba and I switch them back up. But what's interesting is, above what's called the arcuate line, which is about two centimeters below the umbilicus, above that, all the external oblique fibers, so muscle comes down, it's got a fascia on the front of it, on the back of it, anterior posterior. As it comes down, it forms one sheath that passes in front of rectus. Deep, transverse abdominis has one sheath, comes together, it's your posterior component, it passes behind the rectus. And the internal oblique one, its anterior fascia goes in front, posterior fascia goes behind the rectus abdominis. That's how it encloses the rectus. So if you get all four muscles just gently contracting, you've got a fairly rigid structure. It's going to help the back muscles to stabilize your low back, your core. 
Okay, and below that line, all the fascia passes in front of rectus. So in front of the arterial line, all the fascia comes together and runs in front of the rectus. So if you were to come from behind, it'd be a thin trial layer protecting your intestines, and then there's the rectus right there. It's the deepest muscle below the arterial line. Okay? Oh, before you want, what do they do? Obviously, trunk flexion and external and internal leak offs and size will work together to rotate the trunk right, along that line. You think of taking a swing with a baseball bat or throwing a ball, they're going to be important for trunk rotation to generate that energy up. Okay, we think of all the joints. There's a nice little figure and a nice table documenting all the joints involving either the vertebra and the ribs. So costal vertebra would be where the costal rib articulates with the body. Spend some time talking about that. Costal transverse is where the ribs blow by the transverse process. And again, this is primarily the third rib down to about the ninth. Okay. 10 sometimes touches the transverse process, 11 and 12 usually don't. They're just on the body and out. <coughs> So these are costal transverse joints. Cervicostal <coughs> joint, number three up here, where the costal cartilage comes okay, and attaches to the sternum. Sternoclavicular, we're going to spend quite a bit of time on that joint, number five. That's where the clavicle would attach to the sternum. So the first part of your arms, we call it pectoral girdle, <coughs> clavicle, attaches up here. That's its strut. Costal chondral, six. Uh, where are you? Here. Where are you? Oh, there you go. Right there. Rib to the costal cartilage. That's also a joint. Not just where the rib attaches through cartilage to the sternum or body, it's where the, the cartilage actually attaches to this bone, well, the rib. And even 10 and 11, those tiny little ribs that are free floating, they have a little cap on them, like a tube of cartilage on the very top of them. Interchondral, these guys down here, okay, remember those false ribs don't actually directly connect up with the sternum, they connect up with each other. They connect up actually with the costal cartilages of the seven, they do connect to the sternum. Those are interchondral. Two other joints we talked briefly about, maneuvering sternal, where the moving room connects to the body of the sternum. There's a little bit of movement in there when you have that pump angle, breathing. So the maneuver of the sternum do rotate around each other a bit. As you age, that joint will sometimes fuse and ossify, so you don't have that much movement in the upper ribs. And an older person. And likewise, like these sternal junctions, the cycloid process and the, and the body, end of the body of the sternum, little cartilage in there, and most of it still it's still cartilage. If you push on it, it has a bit of a bounce to it. Okay. In me, I still have a bit of a bounce, but it's getting stiffer. And eventually it'll ossify and join up with the sternum. So there's a little bit of movement to that joint. So all of these we kind of have hit on indirectly or directly. Back muscles. So the most superficial ones are the ones we're going to come to because they're actually tied to the arm. They are very superficial back muscles, but their main purpose is to control the scapula and the humerus of the arm. So we, when they talk about these intrinsic back muscles, they're actually the, the start of the deep back muscles. And there's a lot of them, and again, you don't need to know the specifics of what goes from where to where, but to get a general gestalt, because they each have parts to them, and what layers they are. So the first layer is called splenius. The splenius muscle, there's two of them per side. Pretty easy to remember them. And again, they're labeled based on where they go. And that's the same for all of these guys. They have a little bit of labeling that's meaningful for you as to where you would bend them in the back. If you're just starting to second the back, and if you go to the clinical anatomy page, they show you initially the first dissection medical students will do, which is the back muscle. Cadavers on the stomach, and they peel off all the back's skin so they can look at the back. Okay. And if you remove the superficial muscles, you end up with these layers of deep back muscle. And splenius, cervicus, 
and Selenius capitis are the first two muscles that make up layer one. Selenius is supposed to mean uh, bandage, I think. It looks like a bandage, triangular bandage. And that's because they run from midline, usually the spines down around T6, up to C7 and bits of the number of ligaments as well. And the cervicus will run up and laterally to connect to the transverse process of three or four uh, uh, cervical nerves, including one. Okay, so it goes from midline up and grabs the upper cervical transverse processes, including C1. Capitus, well, capitus, skull, cranium. So this one, it goes from the same kind of origin, a little higher, and it'll start doing the massway process in the bit of the, the uh, nuchal line, the superior nuchal line. I don't care about these specifics, but if you look at this, the first muscle, look at the line of action. Okay. If you're trying to bring these two points together, what would happen? Well, bilaterally, obviously, if you activated capitis and cervix together, you get neck extension. Right? You can tell capitis would actually pull the head back, cervicus would actually pull the upper spine back. So these are involved in bilateral activation, head extension, and neck extension. Unilaterally, interestingly, if it's Fleenius capitis, it's going to grab the masculine process, it's going to laterally flex the head, because it can't. It's going outside the center of rotation, here. So if you pull, it's going to bring your head to that side. So unilaterally, they laterally flex. Cervicus would laterally flex the neck. It has no purchase on the head, but it can grab the neck and move it that way. So if you bilaterally activate it's Fleenius, both heads, on the, on the right side, the laterally flex the head and the upper neck. Okay? <laughs> Layer one. Layer two. I learned it at sacrospinalis. The common term you see almost in you know, magazines is director spining. It's the biggest one, and thickest to some extent. It has three parts. Video costellus is pretty well the most lateral component. Longissimus is in the intermediate area, and spinalis runs in the midline. Okay. On a cadaver, if you pulled the uh, latissimus dorsi and trapezius away, all the fascia, okay, and you pulled off splenius, you'd see a continuous big hunk of muscle. But they've broken it into three parts, these three, from lateral to medial. So the most lateral is really costalis, and longissimus, and spinalis. And each part has three parts, based on the region of the spine that they cross. So it looks like a continuous muscle, but it actually is different fibers, and you can't tease them out. And Gideon Costellus will have a lumborum component, a thoracic component, and a cervicus component, meaning that's where they span <coughs> over top of the appropriate ribs of your thoracic. Uh, lumborum will be the lower lumbar region, Cervic cervicus will be in the upper neck area, in the upper thoracic region. Okay, so it's one continuous line muscle fibers and it has these three parts. Longissimus and spinalis don't have a lower lumbar component. It's all fascia. So the lowest part of, long, of longissimus is going to be the thoracic part, then there's the capus part at the top, and the cervicus part until it's just not labeled here. So all of a sudden, while iliacostalis has no attachment to the skull, the more medial parts, longissimus and spinalis, both will connect to the skull. So there's a cervical part to them, the thoracic part, and then their lowest part is the thoracic, right? So thoracic, cervicus, and capitus. That's all you need to know, because what do you think they do? They extend back. Right? If you mass discharge everybody, extend it back. The more medial two components, longissimus and spinalis, because they have a cervical component, will actually also help to extend the neck. By the time you get up there, they're not that big. Director spine is layer two. That's all you need to know. The nerve supply is going to be from all the dorsal rami that come out along here. It's all the levels pertinent to that area. So lumborum, really costalis would be all the lower lumbar dorsal rami that will supply that muscle. Okay? Third layer, transversal spinalis group. Again, three major components to it, but the first part 
semispinalis, semispinalis, semispine. So it's sort of like the upper part of the spine will have this muscle. But it does have three parts as well, easy to remember. Okay. You have the thoracic part, the cervicus part, and again, the capitis part, meaning it's going to connect to the neck. In fact, semispinalis capitis, if you find that groove in the back of your neck, that hole, you push laterally, either way, you find a little ridge of muscle. That's semispinalis. It's actually quite superficial up here. Okay. And then slightly to one side of it would be the cervicus and capitis of the um, first layer. But look at the line here. The game has changed from going from middle out, which is sort of the, definitely the splenius layer, sort of almost vertically would be a regular spine. Now, the fibers are going from out to in. And then semispinalis in three regions. In the low back, primarily, is a deep, deep layer called multipus. When you go to the butcher and you get like a, a lower vertebra, like a pork chop, there's a big chunk of meat on the back. Primarily that. Okay. You think of an eye of round. This is where we're talking about that in the cow, that little part. And quite significantly big, and then as it goes all the way up, this is a different section, all the way up in the cervical region. So it's one continuous muscle, but again, its line is from out to in, out to in, just like this one. That means they're going to have a different kind of function than the other two layers. In fact, if you think of the thoracic semispinalis contracting, it's going to purr full of the spine. Sure, it might help a little bit of lateral flexion because it's grabbing the spine and pulling them this way. It's actually going to cause a little bit of rotation to the other side. And they don't span the whole area. They span about six to eight segments, the three regions. This one, because it attaches to the back of the skull, it's going to really help with neck extension as well, especially with bilateral neck activity. And more goes overall things quite well. So multipitous is the second layer of this. The last one are called rotatories. Tiny, tiny, tiny little muscles. It's really hard to find. You have to have exceptional skill as a dissection to tease these out. And they run either from one segment to the one above, or two segments. So if it only runs from the transverse process to the spine above, it's called brevis. Rotatory brevis, if it runs from the transverse process to the two spines up, it's longest. They're paper thin, very, very thin. A lot of people feel they don't really have a lot of muscular capability, but they're loaded with muscle receptors, so maybe they're helping you figure out where your relative position of the spine is. So more of what's called kinesthetic approach to the task. Well, is big and powerful, so is semispinalis. Okay. Look at different images. Here's another one showing you the better sort of root of multiplicity all the way up. It does go all the way up. But again, it's running from outside to in. They talk about, I'll go back to the previous slide. They talk about sort of semispinalis spanning, let's see, six to eight or six to ten levels. Multiplicity is usually four to six levels. And then the little rotatories down here would be one to two levels in chunks. So they, they have very short distances. It's almost like a whole series of little muscles that they group together into multiplicitous rotatories and semispinalis. This figure is also in more as a bunch of little guys here. I don't care if you know them at all. They're trivial. Okay. Most people don't know what they do. They may be just like rotatories and have more of a function to tell you where your relative position of the spine is. This is a figure from Moore. It's very busy, but it's exactly the same image as we just talked about from Moore 5. Just better laid out, I think, in Moore 5. Here again, same thing as before, but I like this section here because it's a cross section showing you where everybody resides in the basically the lower thoracic region and over right there. Okay, so you can sort of think of where these muscles would reside in that Pork chopping type of area. Next time you get a vertebra. And we're going to talk a little bit more about cross section when we get into the arm because I think it's very important, not necessarily for the back, but if you were to do a cross section through my humerus, that you would know what was superficial, what was deep, what was anterior, what was posterior, what was medial, what was lateral. 
So I call it thinking in cross section. So be able to think, not just looking at something, but if you were to do a cross section and look down or up, can you figure out what relative things were? And I think that'll help you greatly. So we're gonna come back to cross section thinking when we get more into the upper arm. Okay. These guys I want you to know. They're very interesting. You need to know the specific muscle attachments. There are four little muscles in the suboccipital region. That's basically where it resides. So behind your ear, just below the occiput, involving C1 and C2. That's why they're important. So you do a lot of really intricate stuff with your head. Very small amplitude. That 30 degree no, is not a yes. All that can be accomplished to some extent by these guys. They're also very postural, meaning that they keep a relationship between C1 and C2. And if they get out of whack, you can have A, a lot of pain, and B, a lot of control problems, migraines, and pain. So these are kind of important muscles. And again, just think of their naming system. So the first one we'll talk about is rectus, capitis, posterior, major. But what you get from that is, rectus is kind of the shape Maybe it's a bit of a, a fan shape or somewhat ex, sort of like a band. So rectus capitis must have something to do with the head. That would usually be the case. Posterior means it's on the back side of the skull. And major, hinting that there's a minor to come. Okay. There is actually a rectus capitis anterior major and minor that you don't have to worry about on the other side. Just this one. So rectus capitis posterior major, big mouthful. <coughs> Where does it run? Well, it's here right here. This would be the spine of C2, and it runs up significantly laterally to insert into the inferior nuchal line, just medial to where the mastoid process would be down here. Okay, so it has a really interesting angle of pull, and it's connecting C2 spine up to the skull. Okay. The second one, rectus capitis posterior, oh, minor. Minor, why? Well, it's shorter. It actually runs from the posterior tubercle of C1 up to just medial on the inferior nuchal line of the major. So they insert very close to each other. This one's just more medial, and it's coming a shorter distance. It's coming from C1 to it's coming from C2. So both of them have that, again, line of action where they're going out. I'm going to come back to that. Obliquus capitis superior. Obliquus, interesting name. Obliquus, because it's oblique or it's on the outside, it actually runs from the transverse process from C1 up and inserts just lateral to where your rectus capitis posterior major is. Okay. So, tiny little bugger running from C1 up in the transverse process. So, remember, you can feel your transverse process. Ah, yes, right there. You just go a little bit posterior to it and push up. You're kind of pushing on where that muscle is designed. The capitis, capitis, and capitis all insert into the skull. Cool. Now here's where they blew it. There's always something going wrong here. The obliquus capitis inferior. Okay, that's good. So it's superior. But the capitis part is wrong. Because this muscle never gets near the skull. Okay. Instead, it projects from the, the trans, uh, posterior tubercle, if you wish, on uh, part of C2 to the transverse process of C1. Well, it doesn't go to the skull. So capitis was a misnomer. If you really want to call it something, it should be obliquus uh, cervicus inferior, I guess, would be better. But it's not the skull. So you can see it kind of goes out, attaches to the C1 transverse process, and then kind of continues on as the superior component. Um, I don't know the comparative anatomy, but I suspect if you have some animals that have some pretty funky head and neck control, you'll find that that might have been at one point a continuous muscle. And us, we just decided to get rid of it and break it into two separate muscles. But this one, obviously from the, transverse, uh, from the spine to the transverse process, what's it gonna do? Well, going to grab the transit process and rotate it to the contralateral side. It's going to rotate your head the other way. And this one's going to do the opposite, because they can do that. The last thing to remember, and you have to basically go to the lab to think about this, 
Remember where these, we'll call them uh, proximal attachments are, the spines and all that stuff. Where are they? They're up here, right? Where are they attaching? Way back there. So this is a really lovely picture that makes them look like they're in the flat of the screen. They're not. They're all running like this. They're all running way back, especially this one. Biggest cactus is here. It's going to go from the spine of, of basically, or the primitive process of C1 all the way up to the, the knuckle line. It's going to run like this and like this. So if they can drag, right, they're going to try and pull the transverse process or the skull that way. Maybe a little bit of extension, but primarily rotation. And the same for these two. If they're coming from the tubercle, remember how deep that is? Push your tubercle. You can't even find it, it's so deep. But that muscle's coming out and inserting back here, so it's got to run like that. And the body next to it is going to run like that. So they have this big, basically, anterior to posterior direction, all of them. The least would be this one. Because it's just running from the spine to the transverse process. But again, look at their 3D angles, and you'll get an idea of what they do. And they really do help control C1, C2, and the skull. In these little kind of motions. All of them are basically the posterior ramus, uh, I'm an sorry, anterior ramus of C1. It's called the suboccipital nerve. That's all you have to know. So, suboccipital muscles are supplied to the suboccipital nerve. Yes, sir? Um, what is the superior? Yep, so transverse process right here, C1 up and slightly lateral. To where the major insert, so the inferior nuchal line. That's the, the lesser line. The, the bigger line where trapezius is already inserted, the superior one, the lesser one is there, except for protrusions up here. Okay. So you need to know these four. There's specific attachments. And in that book, he actually does talk about them. But when you're in the lab, look at the orientation and think, okay, I want. I want to bring this one closer to each other. If these two points together, what's going to happen? Well, the head's going to rotate this way, it's going to rotate that way, it's going to go back. You'll figure it out by looking at the line of these muscles. It doesn't do it justice to look on a flat plane. You have to see them on round. Okay, major landmarks. All kinds of them. You probably know most of them, anyways. But you've got to think about this thing, this pectoral girdle. It's amazing. And you've got to think about movements of the scapula. So we have elevate, elevation, depression, protraction, retraction. Just think about what the scapula is doing. It's going up, it's going down, it's curling around the thorax, or it's curling back around the thorax to bring together. That's a lot of motion. You can also do this kind of stuff. You can rotate. So the scapula, by rotating, allows you to get your arm into full abduction. When you do this, the whole scapula rotates, and that glenoid cavity opens up to the ceiling. So in the lab, start thinking of what the scapula does, because it's the mobility of the scapula that allows this thing to go all over the place. Sure, glenohumeral joint, or your shoulder joint, is a ball and socket joint, but it's mounted on something that can fly all over the place, for good and for bad. You know this would be of unstable scapula, you can get into a lot of problems in sports, with muscle imbalance and stuff like that. So just remove, remember what the scapula can do and the motions of it, of the limb. So we're the lateral. We have lateral external rotation, medial or internal rotation. Now I've got my elbow flexed. All this is occurring in the shoulder joint. It's all there, right? Hands by your side. You can do this, but it's a bit of funny things happening at the elbow. So I like to do it this way. And some of you will be asymmetrical. Okay. You might have more external rotation than the other side. If you're a pitcher, get a pitcher to do that. <laughs> you know, external rotation up here. Their arm is going to go way the hell back. They're going to have so much range back here if they're a thrower than you and I will. I'm fairly symmetrical. I've been throwing a long time. So, but I remember Tavis, who works for the UBC team, had him do this. One arm was like that, the other arm was like that. <laughs> That's an incredible range he gives himself. So remember those. Okay? Shoulder. If you think of the shoulder versus the hip, we stand on these things. We need a big ball and socket joint. 
where the tip, the acetabulum, and the head of the femur, they're almost covering each other, right? It's a real true ball and socket joint. So it's very stable. The thing we're just about to get into, the shoulder is not. Big head of humerus, tiny little disc it's got to rub up against. So how does it stay there? It stays there with ligaments, it stays there with muscle. So you have a lot of dynamic stuff that actually affords this joint to be in one place, and then the whole thing is mounted on the scapula that floats around. So you have great mobility in the shoulder joint, for good and for bad. So if you go into the beginning of chapter three, I guess, okay, and start reading, you'll realize over the next couple weeks that I'm covering almost everything. There's certain things like a lot of the little blood supply, maybe a lot of the skin, lymphatics, some of the clinical stuff we won't get to. But most of it, it's fair game. Okay, it's gonna come out in the lectures. And we're gonna go until the Friday before your midterm. And whatever I say at the end of that lecture is fair for the midterm. We won't get through the other that. We won't get to the end, I'm sure. We might start it, but we won't get through it. But start learning all these, because every single thing on this page would be fair. And you'll know it very quickly, because you'll have to. Okay? It's all labels, I know it looks intense right now. It's not, it's ridiculous. And the joy is, we're going we're gonna to keep going over everything. <coughs> Again, for the next five, ten, five, eight lectures, we're going to keep coming back to this stuff. So the beginning couple of, maybe ten pages, where they go through the landmarks of the skeleton, it looks like a lot, it's not actually, not at all. And you'll be able to remember pretty quickly. So the key ones, scapula, it has its own landmarks that you need to know. Clavicle has its own landmarks. So here's an anterior view and a posterior view. The clavicle and the scapula, basically we come together. The clavicle attaches to the sternum. That's the only true joint your arm has to the trunk. It's a sternal clavicle to the trunk. It has an indirect one because the scapula is strapped to the thorax by muscles. So you hear in some books the scapulothoracic joint, if you wish. It's not a true joint, right? It's a muscle lying on top of a bunch of other muscle in the rib cage. And it's bound there by muscles that allow it to move around. The true joint is here at the sternoclavicular joint. It's the only one. Right? We spend a lot of time on that joint. You think of the scapula, it's this triangular shaped thing. One thing they did get wrong in the book is they talk about this uh, border here, the medial border and the lateral border, so the sides, if you wish, there's a superior border on top, I think the triangles. I think it more he refers to the medial border. Well, the medial border is actually the vertebral border. He's got them backwards. He says the lateral border is the vertebral border, it's not. It's just the terminology, it's a whole term. You can see how the medial border is going to lie next to the vertebra, so it's going to be also known in its own terminology as the vertebral body. More is the medial border, the lateral border, and then the superior border is the top part right here. Now there's angles too, or pointing dips. Inferior, superior angles to the scapula. And fossa, so they talk about the uh, infraspinatus fossa back here, supraspinatus fossa above what's called the spine. All these terminologies, you're going to be able to check them up really quick because they make sense. Why is this called the infraspinatus fossa? That's where the muscle is. Supraspinatus muscle. Supraspinatus fossa, supraspinatus muscle. Both rotator cuff muscles that control the shoulder. The spine is a really prominent ridge and it curls around at the end here in the area called the acromion. Basically, it looks like the spine is coming out, getting thick and wide, and doing what? That's where you bump into the clavicle. So this is the acromial clavicular joint. So this is where the acromion end, the, the scapula of the scapula and the acromial end of the clavicle bump into each other. So you'll learn all these little terminologies for the scapula, and it won't take long, I promise you. The one other thing is just funny little nostril bit or finger <coughs> part that sticks out. So pick up your scapula in your box and look at it. This sh strange irregular shaped bone. It's got this little coat hanger of a projection that sticks out. It's called the coracoid process. 
So three muscles inserted to that thing, two very important ligaments inserted to that thing. That's why it has this funny shape to it. Coracoid, ah, not coronoid. Coronoid process on the mandible, coracoid process out here in the scapula. Those are the only times I get picky about spelling. Don't tell me coronoid for coracoid, coracoid for coronoid. Don't work because it's the wrong thing. Right? So keep them separate. We get into the humerus, and then I'll stop there because you can cover all this other stuff quickly on your own. But the humerus, scapula, and clavicle basically form the pectoral girdle. Down, the top down view shows you the sternal corbicular joint. Here's your maneuvering from above. You should know that. This is the sternal end of the clavicle. Why? Because it attaches to the sternum. Makes sense. Here's the clavicle curling around. If you notice, you can easily, and you'll see this on the skeleton, as the clavicle goes towards the shoulder, it's convex anteriorly, right? And concave posteriorly. So it kind of goes, wow, for about two thirds of the way out, and then it curls back. So it switches its direction before it articulates with the scapula. So there's a posterior curve here. And then there's this junction between the chromium. There's a nice top view of the chromium, of the scapula, and the chromium end of the clavicle. So same thing, same clavicle, just with all the other stuff removed. You can see its orientation. And then they flip it over so you can see its underside. And you should be able to pick up a clavicle in the lab and go, oh, it's a right one. You should be able to do that by using some of these landmarks. You can figure out, okay, it's like this two-thirds curve here, one-third there, and I'm looking down on it, it's a right one. Or it's like this, it's still a right one, but I'm looking at it upside down. Okay, so take some time, put two down, each box, if someone hasn't ripped off a clavicle, each box has one of each, left and right. Okay? So you can compare them. And it's, I think it's very useful to be able to do that. Scapulas are dead simple to figure out. When you pick one up, you should easily be able to tell you what's left and right based on all these other configurations. So here what they've done is they've shown you a right scapula, but they removed the humerus from the gleno, uh, glenoid cavity. So the glenoid cavity is basically the part that sticks out of the scapula that articulates with the humerus in the glenoid joint. It's going to be covered with cartilage. Okay. To show you the scapula itself, the body of the scapula. Here's this lateral border, or the more lateral edge, the inferior angle of the scapula. The inferior uh, inferior spinous fossa would be on the back here. This is where this muscle would reside. And it's showing me the arch coming out of the screen at you. So as, as the sacromium comes up, that's where it's going to articulate the clavicle. And here's your bony little process called the coracoid process, spelled correctly. And there's two examples of ligaments that you'll come across when we do the ligaments as well. There's a little bump on the top of the glenoid cavity and a little bump below. So again, anatomy is this very logical nomenclature. The little bump below, infraglenoid tubercle. The little bump above, supraglenoid tubercle. Why are they important? Muscle attachment. Biceps, long head. Triceps, long head. So all these attachments and, and the architecture in that very first slide that made all of you cringe, oh, I don't know if I can remember that tree, well, because there's stuff that attaches to it. So the whole landmarks was that first three panel slide <coughs> for the upper limb, and that's pretty well all of this. Okay, we're not gonna cover the guts that go through here yet, until we cover what the guts are, but another area of interest is the axilla. And the axilla refers to your armpit, basically, a region of your armpit. And if you think of it, you can kind of break it into this funny little trapezoidal shaped triangle. And as you cross over the first rib and behind the clavicle, and sort of medial to the acromion, there's a space. And again, I encourage you to look in the skeletons how tiny that space is. It's the point of the V out here. And that's where all the nerves and all the blood vessels to the limb have to go through or come back out of. So it's a tiny, tiny space. And yet they do. Okay. 
So that's this A factor top part of your uh, axilla. Everything's going to go racing through here. So it has four sides and a bottom. The bottom is skin, skin and hair follicles. Right? So if you're in an anatomical position, the bottom of your armpit is basically just fascia and skin. But what happens to the axilla when you do a full abduction of the arm? It will disappear, doesn't it? That potential space becomes a very, very, very tiny space now because you've raised the floor up. The four sort of boundaries, the most, uh, this one on the outside here, the lateral wall, if you wish, is bone. It's the actual humerus on one side. The medial wall of the axilla is going to be the chest wall and all the muscles, the intercostals, and the big muscle that's in here is going to form the inside of it. Anteriorly, the red triangle here on the front, well, two big muscles cross over there, pectoralis major and pec minor. Both will form that flab you feel on the front part of your armpit. The posterior part you can grab on someone's armpit, on the back, latissimus dorsi anterior major. To some extent, a lot of fascia and skin as well. And what else is back there? All oh, the scapula and any muscles that happen to be on top of it as well. So there's a lot more protection for the back of the axilla than there is on the front. There's none on the bottom. Nothing protecting this muscular at all. And if they talk, to, talk about it as being a potential space, because it is, it's at its most potential here in the anatomical position. Right? It's the biggest it's ever going to be. But as you start to move, well, what happens to that space? And again, when you get way up here, it's now very tiny and flat. The vessels still have to go through there, but they have to be adapted to go along the arm now. So how does that happen? Let's get it in there first and find out what they are. What are the blood vessels you need to know for the length, upper limb? And what's the nerve supply of the upper limb? And that's what we're going to talk about on line six. Okay? So start chapter three. Start reading. Because that one you're going to go back and forth, back and forth, back and forth while you pull in all these muscles. And remember, if you're going to lab on Friday, you don't have a lab on Friday. Right? You don't have a class on Friday. Thank you.